Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Um, this is November 7th, 2021, and we're excited to meet with you here again on Zoom. Um, we are so excited again for this morning, um, this month. It's getting chillier, but uh, it's also getting exciting. The holiday season is coming up with Thanksgiving and um, Christmas, where we get to celebrate Christ's birth. And so uh, I, I know this is one of my favorite times of the year, but I guess one thing that I need to remember is uh, obviously the true reason for the season, but also just to remember contentment, uh, to remember gratefulness, um, to not get so caught up in all the different events and uh, shopping for gifts and things like that, but to really remember um, that Christ has already taken care of everything, um, that we have uh, so much to be grateful for as Christians, to um, be encouraged by, and um, I'm just excited for another Sunday service this morning uh, where we can be reminded of God's word and um, fellowship again together online. So we thank you um, for joining us today. Um, a reminder that today is also communion service. Um, it's November, the first week of the month. So if you'd like to go ahead and prepare those elements, uh, we will be taking communion together after Pastor Steve's message. And uh, with that, I'll open us in a word of prayer and we'll get going with the rest of our worship service. Heavenly Father, uh, we're just so thankful again for this wonderful morning. We thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given us here to meet together on Zoom. Lord, we know that uh, we are patiently awaiting uh, the day that we can all hang out and fellowship and congregate together uh, in person uh, at our church. Um, but Lord, the time for the time being, um, we are so excited and grateful that we can meet on Zoom. We know that this is exactly where you'd like us to be meeting at this time. We know that in your sovereign plan, this is uh, how you um, are shaping out our church, how you are continuing to grow our church, how you're continuing to grow us in our spiritual lives. And so I pray and I praise you and thank you for all that you're doing um, to continue to sustain FBC and to uh, continue to grow us in our love for you. We're so excited, Lord, to be with you um, this morning to uh, hear from your word, um, to sing songs of praise to you, and uh, to be, again, reminded of all that your son has done for us on the cross. We look forward to a wonderful worship service, and we hope that uh, all that takes place this morning would be an honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Even though you're joining us online and over Zoom, and we're in front of our screens more than ever, when was the last time that you went outside and just marveled at everything around you? Maybe you looked at the warmth of the sun as you felt its beams coming down on you, or maybe you looked at the, the moon and the stars and the way that they rotate through the night and over the course of weeks and months on a predictable pattern. For those of you that are travelers, maybe you have been impressed by the, the vastness of the Grand Canyon or the crushing waters of Niagara Falls. Whatever it is, the Bible speaks about there's a creator behind all of this creation. And in Romans 1, 20, it says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, 
have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. And Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And so I encourage you to go outside, and as you marvel at creation, that you think about the creator that made all of that, the God that loves us, the one that is immensely powerful, and that he still chose to come down on the form of a man and to die for our sins on the cross. And so as we prepare for worship, We hope that your response will be one of marvel, one of wonder and awe at this great God and that we can't help but respond with great praise and great singing. And so would you join me as we open this time in prayer and worship together? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are a God that loves us. We are amazed at how vast you are and how powerful, and yet we are humbled that you would still choose to be a part of our life, and that we can come before you today to sing and to bring our praises. And so we ask that you would be honored, may you be magnified and glorified. Thank you for this gift to come before you with our song. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I love that yay in the background. All right, we're going to begin a new series today, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at the book of Jonah. And so let's uh, take our Bibles or our devices and turn into the middle of your Bible uh, and then go a little bit further towards the New Testament, and you'll look for a four-chapter book called Jonah. Our precious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to start a, a new book. We are, we are uh, being challenged by doing your will, and we live in a day where it gets tougher and tougher to do your will, and people are more hostile and more uh, resistant to the gospel. Um, Father, there are times that we can fear and rebel and even repel like a Jonah does. Speak to us through your word today so that we can uh, all be used as instruments and servants of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever uh, been intimidated in sharing your faith? Have you um, had one of those situations where you're not really sure if uh, you, you want to serve the Lord in a way that he has been nudging you? Do you have a classmate or a coworker or a relative that you wish to avoid because they're so antagonistic to the gospel and to God, or they're so sinful that you think if you talk to them, somehow it's going to rub off on you? I remember uh, one particular relative uh, that uh, would be very hostile towards the gospel. And knowing that I was a pastor, he'd want to pick on me, but he actually found my wife to be an easier target to pick on too. So he would pick on her. And so sometimes, you know, when we would uh, be at these family gatherings, when he was still alive, you know, it, it, it would be one of those kind of intimidating things. Do we want to talk to him? you know, because he can be very antagonistic to the gospel. Those are some of the challenges that we each might have to bring us into what's called a Jonah moment, where God is nudging us, calling us, telling us straight out to do something, and we give our excuses to say no. I mean, let's think about it. When the church returns to meet live, you know, and we're getting a little bit closer once the once the rains dry out and we can start base rock and paving the uh, the driveway. That's like our last thing, you know, besides getting gas in. And so uh, so while we're waiting for that, do we have excuses outside of something medical, but more on the spiritual end to not come back to church live? You know, and uh, and, you know, we're just battling these things on the inside. You know, I, I have these Jonah moments myself all the time. Uh, there are, in trying to help represent Fellowship Bible Church before the community of Belmont, uh, to build a relationship with the community means to do things with the community and to kind of push yourself out there where I would rather be studying in my non-existent office or discussing theology with you or dozing off in front of a football game, but to push myself to go to community events, to dialogue with people about issues that are not biblical priorities to me, and to talk to people who don't share the same spiritual interests, that can bring out the Jonah in me. But to know that it's important and essential to build redemptive relationships with our community and to be part of the community solution to make our solution better. We, I believe the gospel can change our society. And if, if I can build relationships and share the gospel that is life transforming, uh, that's, that's our mandate. But it's an uncomfortable thing to do. And we can often feel like running from it. And we can be like man on the run. So let's take a look at Jonah and, and see who he is and how he relates to us. Because I think when it comes to ministry nowadays, it's more fearful than ever. It's, it's scary. It's, uh, 
um, Christians are are more maligned than ever. And the current culture that we live in uh, that is hostile to the things of God is very much like the Nineveh of Jonah's day. So I think there's some really great lessons to learn from Jonah. Let's talk about the man I deed, the man I deed. We're identifying the man Jonah. His name means dove. We find in Jonah 1.1, his father's name is Amittai, whose name means truthful. And uh, uh, he is a prophet uh, during the time of Amos to the northern tribes of Israel. So you might say, what do you mean the northern tribes of Israel? Remember, Israel was a united kingdom during Saul, David, and Solomon. But after Solomon, there was kind of a riff in leadership there, and they divided Israel, 10 tribes to the north, and Judah, or the southern kingdom, uh, of, uh, which was two tribes to the south. And the northern kingdom didn't have any good godly kings and Jonah was a very instrumental prophet. You can read in 2 Kings uh, chapter 14 how Jonah, the son of Amittai, was being a prophet challenging uh, Jeroboam II, not the first Jeroboam that you know of from uh, right after Solomon, but Jeroboam II. And, uh, and during the time of Amaziah, he was going to these kings and confronting them about their sin. He is from Gath Hefer. You can see where Gath Hefer is. It's, it's north of Nazareth in the Galilee region. And so, so, uh, so he is from northern Israel, and, uh, uh, and he, is, he is being a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam uh, II. And so, uh, so this, is, this gives you a little sense that hey, he's, he's no amateur. We're, we're, God's not asking a rookie to go into a very difficult situation. But now he is being called by God to go not to his own people, but to his enemies, to the people who, uh, the Assyrians, who have dominated Israel, imprisoned Israel, uh, tortured and brutalized the people of Israel, and Jonah said, why do I want to go to them? They're horrible. It's like if we're called to reach the Nazis or we're called to reach the Taliban or ISIS and, 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 and we're going into really hateful territory to a, a people that our nation hates, right? And, and so, so we're to go to minister to them. You know, you want me to win? Ku Klux Klan people to the Lord, right? I mean, it's just the most hateful of people. And so it's, uh, and that's what Jonah was facing. And so we see the man ID. I just want to give you now the main idea, which is the main idea of the book of Jonah. Because, see, as Jonah is struggling with his pride and his anger and his apathy and rebellion, God is emerging here as the gracious and compassionate God seen in every chapter. And so the main idea of the book is not Jonah's rebellion. It's God being gracious and compassionate. And the challenge is for us to have the grace and compassion of, of the Lord, because Jonah is the antagonist to showing the grace and compassion to the Lord. I mean, in the first chapter, we see God wants to show grace and compassion to the fearful sailors, despite Jonah's apathetic heart. In the second chapter, God wants, wanted to show grace and compassion to Jonah, who had a desperate heart inside the big fish. The third chapter, God wanted to show grace and compassion to this city of Nineveh, despite Jonah's unwilling heart. And then fourth chapter, God wanted to show grace and compassion to Jonah, who had an angry heart. All right. So here what we see is this grace and compassion of God. God is the hero, 
and the central figure of the book of Jonah. It is not Jonah. If Jonah ended at the third chapter, he would have been the hero, right? I mean, here we see the challenge he goes through in chapter one. We see uh, him making, uh, asking for salvation in chapter two. And then we see him uh, preaching to Nineveh in chapter three. And if it ended there, it would have been great. But he went from zero to hero back to zero. God is the main idea. It is his grace and compassion in this book of Jonah. He provided grace through a stilled storm, a whale, a prophet to a rebellious nation. Later in chapter four, he provided grace through a plant and a worm and a wind. So we're going to take a look today at four great realities a rebellious heart must confront before a gracious God. The first of these realities are that we are purposed for great opportunities. Don't waste it. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So here is a city that is great in size, Great in population, great because it was the capital of Assyria, but it was a wicked and evil city. And so instead of just destroying him, in which he could have, he is sending um, he is sending Jonah to go to this city. So here's what we are seeing. First, the call to go. God is calling Jonah to this evil capital city of the most powerful empire of that day to confront their sin. Who wants to do that, right? What kind of fun job is that? You know, I mean, get, you know, let me be a, 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 you know, let me be the, the conductor of the boat ride at the, uh, at the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland, you know, instead of having to go confront Assyria. Right. It's, it's just it's just such a contrast and in, in things to do. The commission was intense. And yet ministry is intense. We're dealing with sin and sinners. We're dealing with rebellious hearts. We're dealing with the unsaved who don't want to hear that Christ is savior. And uh, and ministry can get really tough. I know that there are pastors that can struggle with Jonah moments. 1,500 pastors quit each month. And only 10% of pastors who are pastors will retire as a pastor. I mean, that's, that's huge attrition. And yet, we're called to something so great and wonderful. But the call is intense. It is intensely wonderful. It is intensely stressful. You know, and that's why, you know, we, Pat, on behalf of Pastor Kevin and myself, we are just so grateful for, for you as a congregation. You are a congregation above us, uh, a congregation we don't deserve. And your love and appreciation for us has just been so wonderful. But, you know, it's, it's there. I'm, what I'm trying to say is I identify with those Jonah moments because there's times when God is asking each of us to do something difficult. We can run like Jonah, not only because the commission was intense, we see in verse one, but the city was immoral. It was in an immoral city, but the city was different. It was um, it, it was it was different in the sense that instead of preaching to the northern kingdom that Jonah was used to, now he had to speak to these pagans that had no biblical basis. They didn't grow up learning about Leviticus and sacrifices and the word of God. They didn't grow up with the Old Testament and priests that were giving sacrifices to, to the one true God. And so, so this was really, really different. We don't like to get taken out of our comfort zone, but this was a real different ministry. The, uh, the, the, it's difficult because the city of Nineveh would be very, very difficult to navigate. This city, which was founded by Nimrod, who's mentioned in Genesis 10, 
I mean, so here is here is Noah's great grandson is the founder of this great city. Sennacherib later makes Nineveh the capital of Assyria. You can see that it's kind of shaped in a, a trapezoidal uh, shape. But Jonah 3.3 3 says this city is so large that it takes three days to traverse uh, across the city, you know, walking, right? I mean, you know, not the full 24 hours of walking, but what you would walk in a day, uh, it would take three days to get across the city. There were, at its peak period, 130,000 residents, right? I mean, that's four times larger than Foster City, you know, which, which you might say, well, Foster City's not that big. In the ancient days, that was really, really big, right? I mean, we're not, we're not talking about high rises, right? We're not talking about, um, you know, the modern, modern cities. To have 130,000 residents was mega metropolis in those days. This city is located in modern day Iraq, but I mean, this is this is a different city. It had walls for its defense that were a hundred feet high, and these walls for defense were so wide you could fit three chariots uh, side by side, right? So it's like a three lane highway. That's how wide these walls were. So it is a an intimidating city, not only religiously, not only in its corrupt politics, uh, but, uh, uh, but you, you know, I mean, it's, it, how are you going to get in there, right? So Jonah's thinking, why do I want to go there? You know, so not only was this a, a city that was different, it was difficult, it was also despicable. They were horrifically wicked. I mean, they were so horrific, you know, because there's probably kids listening to, I'm not going to describe the wicked and horrific things that they have done, but it's, it's bad. You can just read about Assyria and just the, the horrors of, of, uh, of, of awful things that they have done. What I will do, though, is I'll sum it up in Nahum chapter three, because Nahum was a book that, uh, that warned of the final judgment of the city of Nineveh. And here's this description. What sorrow awaits Nineveh, the city of murder and lies. You know, I mean, how'd you like to be known as that city, the city of murder and lies? She is crammed with health, with wealth and is never without victims. Hear the crack of whips, the rumble of wheels, horses, hooves, pound, and chariots clatter wildly, right? Like three by three, just on the walls of, of Nineveh. See the flashing swords and glittering spears as the charioteers charge past. There are countless casualties, heaps of bodies, so many bodies that people stumble over them. All this because Nineveh, the beautiful and faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, enticed the nations with her beauty. She taught them all her magic. Enchanting people everywhere. All right, so this is, this is this description of it. Now, the picture that I have here is of uh, one of the gates that uh, survived. I mean, I mean, the city was destroyed. This gate survived, and it was within 10 years ago, recently destroyed by ISIS. And so you can see the destruction picture from National Geographic, which is one of the sad things that ISIS did in destroying the ruins here of Nineveh. But, uh, but, uh, but you know, here was a city described by Nahum as so violent. Nahum would witness 150 years after Jonah, the destruction of this city. In fact, Nahum ends in the 19th verse of chapter three, there is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. I mean, how would you like that? You're, you're so wicked that when your city is destroyed, people are clapping their hands that that city is destroyed. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? So wicked, so wicked. So, you know, here... Here, Jonah is facing a very intense commission, going to a city that is so immoral, that it is so different of a ministry. It is 
absolutely difficult. That they are despicable people, but it was also demeaning. Think about this from Joseph uh, uh, Jonah's perspective. You know what? What are his peers and his friends and his family and his fellow prophets are going to say? You know why are you going there? Those people hate us. Those people killed us. Those people destroyed us and tortured us. You know um, why? Why would you go there? And so here we see Jonah also facing this, this sense of like, you know, why would you go to the Nazis? Why would you go to the Taliban? You know, well, because God loves them, but we don't, we don't think that way. We're, think more, we're thinking more, well, what are my friends going to say? What's my family going to say? That I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a missionary to there, right? I'm a missionary to North Korea. Are you kidding me? You know, and so, so you know, people are going to have judgments, and yet, the heart of Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Paul was provoked in his heart when he saw the idols in Athens in Acts 17. But instead of weeping over sinners, Jonah cared more about his prejudices and his reputation than he did the lost people of Nineveh. That's why he didn't go. It was his pride. And how much of our no to God, how much of we're saying, I'm not going, God, is because of our own prejudice and pride, because we're concerned about what people are going to think. Oh, you go to youth group instead of, you know, what we're doing on Friday nights, you know, and then we're worried about what people think. And so, or, or, you know, why do you go to church on the weekends, you know, and there's, you know, there's so much else to do with us, you know, why don't you get drunk or wasted or, or, or fool around. Right. And, and so, so all these people are just putting all these pressures on us and, and we're more concerned about our reputation and prejudice than we are getting them the gospel. But here's the thing that really stands out. The Lord is compassionate. He loves pagans. He loves Assyrians. He loves Ninevites. He loves sinners. He loves people who didn't grow up with the Old Testament. He loves people who were not in the nation of Israel. He wanted to save the cruel people. It's like the, the Confederates saying, what? God wants to reach the Yankees? You know, or we, we had one of our missionaries at our conference is out in the Middle East and and saying, you know, you're surrounded by a bunch of terrorists. You know, do you feel unsafe? And he goes, no, the people around us are very loving. I mean, they're there, but, you know, they kind of keep hitting themselves and, and aren't part of the everyday uh, um, uh, loving community. But sometimes we can have these, these, this uh, attitude, you know. And so, so who has been the most difficult person that God wants you to share with? So we can rebel from God, but we can never escape him. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So here we see in verse three, twice it's mentioned, he's trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. He's going away from the presence of the Lord. So we see that he goes down to Joppa. And a lot of times when it says he goes down to Joppa, it's this indication he's moving away from God. Because even if he wasn't going south, they say he's going down because the Lord's up. But he would go to Joppa to go catch a ship. Instead of going east to Nineveh, he would go almost five times the distance west to get as far away as you can go from Nineveh. Tarshish is, uh, is in Spain, uh, modern-day Spain. And, um, and, and so, so here, here we see that uh, he, he was trying to get as far as he could. Herodotus, a Greek historian, identifies Tarshish being in southern Spain. So, you know, he's, uh, you know, my apologies to Elton John and Bernie Toppin, but Jonah is leaving tonight in such pain. I can see the red tail lights headed towards Spain, you know. And so, 
you know, so every time you hear that song, you can think of Jonah going to Tarshish. That's where he's going, as far away as he can from God. But, you know, he knew the Old Testament. He knew the writing of David. He knew the 139th Psalm that says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? I mean, if I'm in heaven, you're there. If I'm make my bed in shield, you are there. Or as Jeremiah 23, 24 says, can man hide himself in secret places? so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? You know, where can we really go to run from God? And so when we're running from God, where are we going? When we're trying to hide from God, you know, it's like every parent knows where their kid's playing peekaboo and hide and seek at because there's only so many places to hide, you know? And, and yet he has greater omniscience and omnipresence than and how can we hide from him? But then it says, but the Lord, even though Jonah tried to flee, but the Lord, we can run, but we cannot hide from God. You know, we will see lives try to run from God and it's tragic and it's sad. But I love the verse in Philippians 1, 6 that says, and I am sure of this, or be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. You know, if he started something good in you, he is going to continue that work. He started something good in Jonah, and he's not going to let him go. And he started something good in you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're running from him, he is not going to let him go. We can try to flee from the presence of the Lord, but the Lord. So what about the Lord? Well, the third point is we can keep our rebellion to ourselves, but others are affected. We can keep our rebellion to ourselves, but others are affected. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Now, this is the first of 10 miracles that we see in the book of Jonah. Miracles are an indication of God's grace. The fact that he is intervening in the human story in a supernatural way means that he cares and he is gracious in getting our attention. So he hurls a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea and the weather started getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, the sailors who, who spend their life on sea, who are used to rough storms. They're not usually afraid of a sea storm, but this one made them afraid. And they each cried to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. So here they were each praying to their own pagan gods. It's interesting that the Roman Catholic Church has patron saints that people will pray to before Jesus when the Bible says there's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. There's no other mediator. You don't need patron saints, but the Roman Catholics have seven patron saints of the sea that you can call on before you call upon Jesus. St. Uh, Brendan, St. Nicholas, St. Christopher, St. Clement, St. Elmo, St. Francis of Paola, and St. Focus the Gardener. None of them are going to answer. And it's just like these mariners who were crying out. And then they, so they, they tried religious solutions. They tried to lighten the ship so the water wouldn't add to the heavy weight bringing the ship down into the water. But all of that, Jonah's asleep. But Jonah had gone down in the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came up and said to him, hey, little buddy. No, he didn't say that. But he says, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. I mean, we're all trying our gods, right? They're trying they're in this pagan syncretism. They're trying, hey, you try your God. You try your God. Why don't you go try your God? We're, we're desperate, right? So here in this pagan syncretism, you know, pagan because it's other gods, syncretism is where you say, you know, I'm going to try to employ all of them. You know, I'm going to use Confucius, Muhammad, uh, uh, Buddha, and uh, whatever new age things in Hinduism. You know, I'm going to cover all my bases, 
right? And he says, well, then why don't you call out to your God, Jonah? Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And so they said to one another, come, let us cast lots. Now, this is kind of like dice that were made out of the ankle bone of a sheep. Uh, and we don't know exactly how that works, but but uh, we do read in um, in 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 Proverbs that Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So this is some way that they were used to determine. And God's other miracle was using the, these tossed dice to indicate it was Jonah who is the cause of the evil that has come upon them. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us, On whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So here we see our running from God affects people. You know, we think maybe we can just sleep and and hide from it. You know, we can just close our eyes and pretend our rebellion will just go away, right? And, 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 And hey, hey, sleeper, other people are being affected by your failure to obey God, by your failure to bring forth the Great Commission for your failure to intervene in comforting somebody with the word of God or challenging somebody with the word of God or being a prophet like Jonah, right? We can try to keep our rebellion to ourselves by sleeping it off, but other people are affected. And then here's the last point. If we don't fear God and repent, God can use our judgment to bring others to fear and repentance because that's what's going to happen. Jonah didn't repent. And so God's going to punish Jonah. But what happens is the sailors will repent because of what happened to Jonah. You don't want to be that guy, do you? You don't want to be that gal, right? The one who's supposed to be right with God because we grew up in Israel or grew up in the church. We know the word of God, yet our failure to heed it has caused the pagans to trust God. That's what happened here. Verse 11, they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. So I want you to know, it wasn't the sailor's idea to toss Jonah into the water. It was Jonah's idea. Okay, so we're not blaming the the, the sailors here. It, It was Jonah who said, pick me up, hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men wrote hard to get back to dry land. All right, so they didn't want to throw him yet, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not onto us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So now, They're praying to the one true God. Then he picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then this is incredible. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. All right? So they fear God, not just a little bit, exceedingly. Right? They offered a sacrifice to the one true God, not the pagan gods. And they made vows. I don't know what vows they made, but probably like, all right, Lord, if you get me through the storm, I'm going to live my life for you, right? Maybe that kind of a vow. And, and But any whatever it was, here they responded the way Jonah should have responded. Who knew better? And the ones who didn't know better, they responded rightly before God and God saved them. That's the grace and compassion of God. We can run from it, but he still cares. And so 
you know, there's three reasons to run to him instead of from him. Because, you know, maybe right now with the challenges of ministry or witnessing somebody or God urging you to do something, there's three reasons to run from him or to him instead of from him. First, God is gracious to call us to serve him. I mean, think about the opposite of what the two angels had to do in Genesis 19 when God called them to call judgment on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Jonah didn't have to do that. He was going to be able to tell, to tell the people of Nineveh that God would relent his judgment if they repent. You repent, he relents, right? So our, our repentance goes to his relenting of judgment. What a privilege it is to share good news, right? The alternative of sharing bad news of judgment. I mean, that's what Amos had to share was the bad news of judgment. I mean, uh, 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 um, uh, Nahum, right? Had to share the bad news of judgment. And, and, and here, Jonah gets the privilege of sharing good news, good news of, of an offer of mercy from God. Secondly, God is gracious to love people we hate. Oh, we have our prejudices, don't we? Or we have people we're afraid of. Or we see some ministry task too difficult to undertake. Right? But, hey, God called us to these things. He's, he's going to use us. And then the third reason to run to him instead of from him, God is gracious to save those who are godless and pagan. And, you know, in the Old Testament, the problem is sin. In the New Testament, the problem is sin. Today, the problem is sin. And uh, the Bible warns of judgment and the judgment of hell. But if we repent of our sins and we turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we trust his work, his death on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin, and that he rose him from the dead on the third day. And if we place our faith in him, God is gracious to save us to withhold judgment as he did to Nineveh, he will for us. And for that reason, we're so grateful for the cross of the Lord Jesus. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the great call you've given us believers to be your witnesses in the Great Commission, to share good news. The gospel is good news. Father, I pray that uh, you will help us understand how gracious that is of you and that you love the people we hate, and that you love those who are godless and pagan, because that was us, who before we trusted Christ as our Savior, we were godless and pagan. And so, Father, thank you for loving godless pagan people to save them through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it, help us to be obedient instead of running from your grace, that we'll run straight into it and find the Lord Jesus as our strength, our comfort, and our authority. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. I really appreciate that. Yes, uh, as the Holy Spirit empowers us, we can love people that uh, are difficult to love or that are enemies or don't like us for different reasons. And um, you know, God still calls us to be witnesses to them. We're going to take part of our in our morning uh, communion uh, this um, at this time, and so if you have some of the elements available, it, this will be a good time to to get in front of you. I'm just going to um, mention a little bit about another Old Testament character, and uh, our high school Sunday school is going through a study of Joshua, and uh, one of the um, things about that I really love about Joshua is that God used to, an ordinary man, uh, just like he used Jonah, he used an ordinary man for his purposes. And uh, as Moses wasn't allowed to bring the Israelites into the promised land, um, God raised up another man, that was Joshua. And you know, under Moses, the uh, Israelites saw great miracles, the great power of God as he took them out of Egypt and he brought them to the Red Sea just when the Israelites thought they were cornered and the Egyptian army came up upon them. God did a miracle and protected them from the army with fire 
And, um, and we see that he opened up the Red Sea and the Israelites crossed, the two million Israelites crossed onto the other side. And it, as the Egyptian army pursued them, um, God wiped them out. And so that generation of Israelites saw God's power and might and protection, but yet they still rebelled in the wilderness and God didn't let them go into the promised land. But after 40 years later, that generation died off. There was a new generation that God was leading to the promised land. And that was going to be led by, by Joshua himself. And so uh, God did another miracle for this new generation going to the promised land. And that was to cross the Jordan River. And so as they were headed to the promised land, um, they came across the Jordan. They came to the Jordan River. They were ready to go to the other side. And uh, again, the priest stepped into the, the Jordan River and God parted the Jordan River for this new younger generation to see. And the Israelites passed onto the other land to go uh, past the Jordan River to get to the other side of the prop to the promised land, the land that God was going to empower them to uh, to overtake and to dwell in and to uh, and to. Uh, it was a it was a land of flowing flowing with milk and honey, and no longer did they have to depend upon the manna that God provided on a daily basis for those forty years in the wilderness. Now they're going to take part of the fruit of the land, but in the midst in the midst as the uh, high priest uh, as the priests were standing in the water, and it was still being parted. God gave a command uh, for Joshua to get. Uh, a member of each of the 12 tribes to get uh, uh, two sets of memorial stones. And one memorial stone was to be brought over from the midst of the Jordan to the other side in the promised land and set up over there on the other side. And uh, there was another uh, set of stones to be just laid in the Jordan itself. Joshua 4, 20, 22 says, and those 12 stones, which they too came out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until he had crossed over. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord, your God, forever. So God set up a, 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 uh, a, um, a, a, an area where future generations could see, other nations could come. And it was a testimony of God's power and might and uh, what he had accomplished uh, in bringing the Israelites into the promised land and how he, he parted the Jordan River for them. Um, these stones shall be for memorial to the children of Israel forever. So that was a reminder for the nation of Israel, what God had done for them. Today, as we partake of the Lord's Supper um, and we partake of the, the bread and the cup, God wants us to remember. He wants us to be people who don't forget. And our remembrance is about the greatest event of all, and that is the redemption of mankind. Pastor Steve pointed out the sinfulness of uh, the people of Assyria, but we also see the great sinfulness of Israel. And we know when we understand uh, through the scriptures that we have sinned and our, sins, our sin is just an abomination to an all holy almighty God. But God still loves us. Just like God wanted Jonah to love the Ninevites, God still loves us. And he wants us to, he wanted us to be redeemed. And so his son came to die for the very people who hung him on the cross, us. And he, and he uh, redeemed us by uh, giving up his life. And so the, the bread represents the body that was broken on Calvary. Uh, the cup rem reminds us of the blood that was spilt on Calvary because God loved us and he redeemed us. 
And so uh, uh, the stipulation that God gave us was that, you know, we need to know the Lord in order for us to take part of this communion service. And if we know the Lord, we need to examine our hearts. You know, God, Christ died for our sins. And so we can't hold on to our sins. We have to, we have to confess our sins and give it over to him and not, and be people, um, you know, who, who have a clear conscience when we, when we're partaking of this communion service. And so let's uh, bow in prayer and let's give thanks for the bread and the cup. Father, we, we, th- we want to stop and just think about your redemptive work on the cross. Lord, you've done so many things. You've been so patient for, for mankind through the years. And Lord, we don't deserve uh, this kind of forgiveness, but you offer it to us. And you gave your very life for us so that we might have the forgiveness of the penalty of our sins. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for enduring the cross being obedient uh, to the father and to come down and to uh, be willing and giving up your life for us. And so as we partake of the bread that represents the body that was broken, the cup that was represents the blood that was spilt. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us in Christ's name. Amen. So if we take uh, our bread, eat this, and members of him. The cup represents the blood that was spilt for us on the cross. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the work of redemption on the cross. We thank you that you've done this, even though we, as as the, as the Syrians, we as the uh, uh, people, the Canaanites in in um, in the Promised Land, Lord, we have similar hearts. We're sinful people, but we thank you that you have given us um, redemption through Christ and that our sins are washed away because of the blood of Christ. Thank you that we can stand before you as if we have never sinned because of not our own righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. And so we thank you and praise you for that. And uh, Lord, help us to always uh, remember and commemorate uh, the act that you have done for us on the cross. In Christ's name, amen. If you have your... um, prayer requests or any praises, you can put it in the chat box and Ryan will graciously uh, go through it uh, for us here at the end. Our uh, children's series continues today. Um, There was no meeting last week, but we are meeting this week, the first week of November at 1230. Um, Pastor Steve does not have his class this Tuesday, just a reminder for that. Our youth study school class happens right after uh, service here. Uh, FBC Zoom 3 for middle school, FBC, FBC Zoom 2 for high school uh, as we do our Sunday school classes. If you are looking for the link, you can always go on our website. Our, um, our website has the direct links to FBC 2 and FBC 3 under Sunday school events. Online giving is uh, always possible. You can find that on our website as well. Cancer Support Group meets today on Zoom 1 at 1 p.m. And today uh, today is the last day to sign up for the free meal uh, for our Thanksgiving praise celebration. Uh, It is next Saturday at at 7 p.m. The meals uh, can be picked up, the free meals can be picked up from your pastor's homes in uh, South San Francisco, Foster City. The addresses are on the uh, registration form. And so you can just write it down. You can sign up for a time to pick up as well. And uh, if you take a picture of this uh, this, uh, link, or you can go to the FPC website and the link is di- the uh, link is directly there. And so sign yourself up, sign, invite uh, some friends, 
we're going to have an invitation to the celebration uh, um, on a card that's put on the uh, meal box. And so um, it'll be an invitation for them to join us at 7 p.m. So we're, we're praying that many people who don't know the Lord will come, just like uh, our live Thanksgiving banquets through the years that we had a lot of guests and friends. And so we pray that this will be a time of celebration for our church family and a time of shared gospel with others. Um, our missionary of the week is Penny Hardin, and uh, she is with the Deaf Ministry up in um, up in up north, and here in California. And so we want to pray for her. Let's let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for um, all our missionaries. But we want to pray specifically for Penny. Thank you for her ministry to specifically the deaf uh, folks um, in Vallejo area, Vacaville area. We pray, Lord, for their church. Um, Lord, what a what a unique opportunity it is to minister to a certain demographic that needs you. And so we pray for uh, their men's leadership training, that it will go well, that men will take on the leadership role in this church. We pray for spiritual growth for one of the ladies there uh, who, uh, and for the salvation of another lady uh, who is uh, – uh, going through cancer treatment. And uh, so uh, we pray for these two individuals, Lord, for growth and for salvation. We also pray for their outreach to continue as they try to reach out to others who are suffering from hearing impairment. And so use uh, Penny, Lord, and all those at her church to uh, reach out to the th this group that really needs Christ. And so uh, um, thank you for her faithfulness to you. And so, Lord, uh, dismiss us um, with your blessings. And as we go through our prayers, uh, requests, and our praises, may we give uh, honor and glory to you. In Christ's name, amen.